And the way we got involved in it, um, a little bit by accident. So uh, the National Response Team of PDA formed in uh, 1996. Uh, prior to, uh, uh, to 96, there was a disaster office, but primarily it was a phone call and prayers and a chat. And uh, in the mid 90s, uh, in keeping with the idea of being an international church, we realized that we need to do more than just a collective phone call, but we need to train some volunteers who can deploy on behalf of the denomination uh, to stand beside presbyteries and congregations, do assessments of what we're doing. Uh, what have you, and so and so we formed. And uh, one of the people that was on that first team was past president Bob Barnes, Bob in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the Albuquerque area. And, um, and he uh, was a fire chaplain and a police chaplain. And I believe he had some experience of uh, that when responding to Marville that was bombed uh, earlier in Oklahoma City. And so when Bob got on the team. Bob uh, said, you know, these cause disasters are, are just uh, they're more complex. Uh, there's dynamics that are at play in human caused disasters that are not that are not at play in a natural cause disasters. So Bob pushed us that we really need to develop a, a sub team or a subset of teams that has some training to respond to human caused events. And that was in um, like 97 and then 98. Uh, the shooting happened at Columbine. And so uh, there were several of us, myself included, that had had some specialized training. And so we deployed to um, uh, Colorado, the, the Columbine shooting. There was a church, Columbine United, that was very close to the school. And the pastor there was very close as well as the uh, church. And so that was our, our first official PSA deployment. And since and uh, we certainly uh, gained wisdom in how to do those methods more effectively, and we a lot of, of that wisdom in terms of our protocol and the way we respond to human caused disasters. And it was just a very, very traumatic event, uh, and something, I mean, the bottom line, I know what you're talking about, and a uh, very, uh, very traumatic event. Uh, Rick Turner, who I introduced yesterday, Rick is a former associate response in the U.S. And uh, Rick held this position uh, up until uh, December 31st of 2016. I started off as an overlap, and uh, Rick, I'm a disaster response person, and a lot of people caused disaster deployment. So uh, I've asked Rick to share just a few uh, thoughts, reflections on some of the human caused disaster deployments he did. Just to help us understand, you know, I can do the facts and the slides, but, but talk more about the human element uh, in terms of those who are impacted. While he's getting his last minute thoughts together, uh, interestingly enough, Debbie reminded me yesterday that we had a human cause disaster, at least one in this cemetery, in August of 16, September of 16. There was a shooting at. Yeah, and, and so I, as, a, as is our protocol, I reached out to Dave Foster and Debbie and I talked, and I'm not sure how much of that filtered down to you, uh, Peggy, the church, but we didn't, we did not that instance, but, but we did make that connection uh, because of uh, what happened. So, um, Rick, if you could share a few thoughts about that. Uh, as Jim said, when I was a volunteer, I, I was deployed to several. I, and as Jim was talking, I, we talked last night, I was thinking probably at least a dozen human caused disasters to which I've been deployed. And I got to thinking there were three, basically three different types. And of course, the one that was most prevalent was shooting. Um, Representative Gabby Giffords out in Arizona. I, I went to that first four hood shooting. Got some of those you know, some you don't. We have a, um, a number of shootings that I actually happened 
in the church or on the church property. Uh, the second time that I was deployed to, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there was a gas pipeline exploded in Bruno, California. And one of the unfortunate things, many unfortunate things, but one of them was one family had three members that were elders of the church out there. And um, two of those died in that fire. I mean, in fire. And, and it just happened so fast that I don't, I don't even know if they know what happened. Their house was so close to the explosion. And so the, obviously the church was devastated. And they called it. The other kind of human caused disaster um, happened in Flint, Michigan. You probably heard us talk about that last night. Um, that's where there were some bad decisions made at several different levels. It ended up being at the top level inside the state that caused them to switch where the city got their water from a big clean source. Save some money, they decided to start pumping it out of the river. The person or people that made that decision didn't realize that river had been polluted since back when there was logging in the area, and it went to carriage industry, the automotive. And the, um, the chemicals in the water caused um, lead from the pipes to be. Uh, into the water, it, it leaked or leached into the water, and it's it's still going on. And as Jim mentioned last night, those people are are still paying for their city water even though they can't drink it. And um, we we went out there. I guess it was in sixteen, and we've been working with them ever since. And we we have a film based on some of our response and some of what happened about that. Are there any questions about the, the ones that I've been deployed to that I can answer? Things I've seen that, that very prevalent human caused disasters, but I personally call it what if you know, what if those people hadn't have been at home when that pipeline closed? Um, the, I think there was a, a husband, his son, his mother there, but the daughter, mother happened to be in a car driving that way. They weren't affected by the mm -hmm. fire. Uh, what if I had not gone wherever I went that day? What if I had turned left and right? Um, we had a very close friend whose husband was in very good health. Died. He felt bad for a couple of days, and his wife tried her best to talk him into going to the hospital. And it was over the week. So I waited to my first one. And last night, my wife was having dinner with her, and she was going through all the what if questions. You know, what if I had made him go to the doctor? What if I'd have put him in the What if I'd asked him one more time? That, that's the main factor that I see in human thoughts. That there's just, there's, it's, it's, I don't want to say a game of inches, but sometimes inches, seconds, minutes can make a big difference. And that causes a lot of uh, people to sit around and think,
I would say I don't think it does. If I spoke of probably three or four. You hear, we hear in South Carolina did hear. One of them was the murder, double murder, suicide in Wilmette, Illinois. It happened on church grounds. A uh, child of the church was killed, mother was killed, and they were living in the house on the property. Another one uh, happened in a church out in uh, Idaho. Where the spirit came in, he actually broke into the church. He had already shot some people in the outside, but he broke into the church at night. He ended up killing, uh, killing the, the living custodian. The custodian was in the office, apparently on the phone, trying to get help, and he shot him. And I, I, I didn't hear about that anywhere. So there's, I'd say, probably anywhere from 10 to 20 percent that are just. Shootings that involve the church one way or the other that really don't make the national news. It's just a guess, but just based on my experience. Any other questions? Yeah. Every weekend, basically, third Thank you. Let me let Jim explain the deployment process. I'm not sure he's going to do that anyway. It's, sometimes it's a uh, little complicated. Thank you. Certainly, we're, we're thinking about these kinds of events in ways that we did not. Thank you for sharing, for sharing that. So, um, so what can we? What, what kind of response do we have? Um, I want to pull up this slide. So, what we? So, I want to pull up uh, our mission statement because uh, our, we follow our mission statement everything. But everything we do have is about uh, the congregation and partners to raise the witness of the of Christ uh, in the package. And we follow the same uh, this protocol. Uh, we always are looking for not only the immediate response, but how can we be involved long term in helping the community everything, such as something like this, and then working collaboratively that whenever we go into a community, what the disaster is the reason, we're always looking to be the one uh, to bring these values with us. And that's true in human caused disaster. Uh, in fact, uh, for those who do deploy to human caused disaster, uh, normally they, they count on being engaged in that community uh, at least uh, as a community goes through that first year of dealing with it and then the one year configuration, possibly even longer after that. So these are very much. So um, I have a, a short video, it's about three minutes, and this is uh, Dr. Eric Gentry. He, uh, he is a, a world-known uh, authority in uh, crisis prevention trauma response, and he's been very gracious on the first of the PDA to participate in some of our programs. So this is a little clip of the impact of a human caused event versus a natural As a society, there's never been there's never been anybody alive that has witnessed because of how much trauma we've imbibed since when we were children. One of the first things you see in a shooting scene, especially when it's a is media. 
and that gets transferred to social media. And we start watching. Within 15 minutes, we have a viral explosion of this into the consciousness of the nation. Beyond that is what you're calling a ripple effect, what I'm calling a contagion. The action of one person has infected hundreds of men. And that happening day in and day out. How is gun violence and other forms of violence, how is that turning into symptoms for individuals in the culture? What's that do to a community, a city, a country, a state? Is it makes people more and more and more free. We are collectively perceiving a more dangerous world. Secondary trauma produces a perceived threat where there is no danger. A constant diet of imbibing trauma, fear mongering, an intense increasing of anxiety, increasing of perceived threat. You can't do that without, a, without an impact. It's, it's, it's gradual and cumulative. And what it produces is a state of chronic reactivity and symptoms. People who are trauma saturated can't hear it. They can't listen. They become polarized. Which means that it needs to be addressed deliberately. It is a, an incremental, bipartisan, multiracial, all socioeconomic step. It pervades everybody. And the solution is unity. Not unanimity. Unity. Not everybody being the same. Everybody is welcome to their differences, but in a and deliberate process of, of starting to make things better with dialogue first so that you can hear each, each other's sides and without it producing so much polarization that we can't move it forward. We can't move it forward when you say polarization is stuck, it's in stasis. So one of the things that, that Eric highlights um, about a difference of a human caused disaster is the impact that it has not only on the community where the disaster occurs, but what, what kind of impact it has on the body as well. Um, I'm not sure if any of you remember this, and this is a person who does a lot of work with first responders with military, his name is David Grosser, and he does a lot of training. Oh, you're familiar with him, okay. I heard him speak, and he talked about it this way. That if we were in a group of people like this, I pulled out a box and um, I took out a spider and the spider was out in the audience. About 10% of the people would go around speaking and the rest would get out of the way. Uh, if I got a snake, I would take out of a box and throw it on the ground. Same thing, about 10% of the people would have that kind of public response and one of you would go over and pick it up and take it out of But if I were to come in and, and if I would pull a gun out of the box, 90% of you. Would have a public response, and and it, it, would, it would strike you that that intensely uh, that it would be it was a very traumatic event, and and human caused events and the way that we continually hear about them is having that he called it a contagion or, or a ripple effect throughout the whole society. So you know I'm sure a lot of you watched the uh, uh, what happened uh, in states with hurricane. I know that's that means a lot to you because you've been affected by hurricanes. Uh, and I'm sure you were very concerned, probably, probably not overwhelmed. But we can hear about something that happens someplace else in a theater, in a church. That's our context here, in a church. And all of a sudden, no theaters are, are well, safe. Uh, churches are no longer safe. Doctors' offices are no longer safe. Uh, uh, Walmarts are no longer safe. So it has that kind of effect. And when people are traumatized, you heard him talk about this, they're constantly living in that state of uncontrol. And fearful people just flat out make bad decisions. Uh, and you've heard about the polarization, us versus them, right or wrong, left or right, everything or nothing. And we get into that polarized state, we just get frozen, and, and we can't do reasonable things uh, or faithful action. And, and so that's how overwhelming these kind of events are that separate them from a natural disaster. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then, you know, I know um, Sharon, right? Sharon. Sharon and I actually, uh, for a short time, 
served on an international cycle service that, that I never ended up going with, but went a couple of times internationally. And, and see that, that internationally, the places you go with chronic war or genocide or chronic oppression and how that impacts and their ability to be able to take action. And so people do that all the time. And, uh, and, and not a good thing. So uh, we do have an overview of four phases of human caused disasters. Kind of outlines a little bit or summarizes a little bit. But uh, you have, and those of you who are familiar with disaster response, you see the uh, phases of a natural disaster as well. You have to typically have the event, uh, people, you have that heroism, uh, you know, Greenville strong, uh, Louisville strong, you know, everybody's going to be strong. And you have that heroic kind of adrenaline phase. But, but that, that, has a short lifespan. And then you get the valley uh, where there's disillusionment and despair and all of that. But as people log a lot of out, then you do have the performing phase. And then people, if they stay the course, if they're willing to wander in the wilderness for however long it takes, they do find, they do find the promised land. And we call that wisdom. And then you can see along the bottom, these are the interventions that people really have. So the very first thing we do is we go in and ministry to the high budget and talk about it. One of the ways that that um, that uh, <coughs> cause is different is that with a with a hurricane, you had Dorian uh, off the coast. There were weeks. I, mean, I don't know what was it, two weeks that we knew of Dorian, watching it and plotting and when to leave, when not to leave, where it's going to go. But with human caused disasters, you generally have absolutely no warning, absolutely no warning whatsoever. You're enjoying a concert at a beautiful outdoor venue in Las Vegas, and then it just depends. Um, you normally, if you're, if you're watching TV, whatever, getting ready for dinner, and a pipeline. Um, you know, no warning, no anticipation, and that also difficult in the problem that you're talking about. And, and again, not just not just the people who, who experience it firsthand, but the rest of us who are watching and hearing about it. Um, and, you know, if there's a church shooting on a Saturday night, I'll bet you $10 that anybody who comes to church on Sunday morning has that on their mind across the across the country. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, about what you can do. Before we talk about how PDA can come in, what are, what are some things that you can do? And, um, and I think there's a lot of things that you can do that can be very, very tangible. And, so I'm going to pass out a resource to you. So, well, actually, Sharon is going to pass it out. Uh, but everything I'm going to talk about, you can see the link. So don't worry about uh, taking a picture or anything like that. Uh, but there are definitely some things you can do. And the first thing I want to talk about is what you can do theologically. Um, how many human elders in the room? Okay, so maybe about half and half and ruling elders. Um, but I think the first thing that, that we can do theologically uh, and work with our conversations in terms of, of how, do you, how do you understand these events theologically? Um, for instance, if, if you're in a church that teaches the church on Sunday, give your 10%, follow the Ten Commandments, blessed are you. you know, your fields will yield grain and your house will be full. All will be right with the world. If that's what people are hearing and that's what they believe, when an event like this happens, then how can you make sense of it? It just doesn't fit into their worldview or their theological view. I think I think what we do in the pulpit, what we do in our education classes, that that give us a theology that is strong enough, that is large enough to deal with these things. Uh, I often use this as an illustration. I'll use it now, how many remember? Um, uh, the rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a book. Do you remember the title of the book? Oh no, different, different person. Okay, and, and you guys played along really well. You helped me out with this. Uh, but you hear what they said? When bad things happen, you can see them. That is actually not the title. That is not the title, but it's what most people say, myself included. Because I think that's kind of our. Our, especially our Western mindset, that if you, if you do 
right thing, if you obey all the rules, uh, if, if you follow the Ten Commandments, then, then everything will happen well. And when you say when bad things happen, I think it presupposes that they should. Or that somehow, um, oh, wait a minute, did I just get that wrong? Yeah. I did. Well, I did. I did. I did. I got it wrong. Okay, I got it wrong. Okay, we're going to edit this. We can sit here the last two minutes. I did that absolutely wrong. Most of the time, people say why bad things happen to people. Uh, thanks. Sorry about that. So it's on me. It's on me. But but that kind of presupposes that there's an answer to the question, and they shouldn't happen. The title of the book is When Bad Things Happen to People, which presupposes that the rain is going to fall on the good people alike. That, that we live in a world where bad things happen. And, and where our, our church, our faith, our theology speaks to us is when those bad things happen, when we're in the valley of the shadow, the good news is that we do not fear. The good news is we're not alone. The good news is, is that God accompanies us through those valleys and we still the course of the so, so I think we need to be mindful of, of preaching, uh, of our that we can make room to talk about when bad things happen. Um, okay, we just figured that we're all good. Um, um, but yeah, so so yeah, when things happen. So so that's one of the ways that we can deal with it. So I'm going to read a section of uh, a book that. Thank you. Um, that really helps. And this actually is a story from a pastor at the church in Lament, uh, Lament Illinois, where there was a double murder suicide on church property. And and I think this speaks to how sometimes our theology that we teach in church is not always the most helpful. So uh, here we go. There was a murder and suicide on church property in a large suburban congregation that took the lives of two congregational members and a member of the youth. A few weeks after the tragedy, during the season of Lent, the senior pastor, Sarah Butter, shared from the pulpit a miracle theological tale that had occurred within her since the trauma. Growing up in a traditional congregation that had the same pastor for over 30 years, she had memorized and recited the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, but with one omission. She descended into hell. The longtime pastor did not believe that Jesus had descended into hell and had personally marked out that line in every hymn book the congregation had on. She shared that having never affirmed Jesus descended to hell during her Sunday school years, she felt no need to incorporate that affirmation into her own pastoral theology when she was ordained. Until today. When I realized that since this tragedy, this congregation has descended into hell. And if we have and if we have to go down into hell, it is comforting to know that Jesus has been there before us and can show us the way out. It was a powerful, intuitive shift revealed through the experience of trauma that made the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus deeply personal and real, not just for that season, but for many seasons of pastoral care that they had. Um, my opinion is, or my observation is that in most of the Presbyterian churches in the United States, we, we forget about the whole tradition of lament. Lament of the Psalms, the Book of Lamentations, we forget about that. And, and that's to our detriment. Uh, it's like, well, we don't, we don't want to make people feel bad. And, and my, my experience is that a lot of people are already feeling bad that are in these on Sunday. Bad because of something with their children. Bad because of something in their own life. Bad because of a of a uh, diagnosis, bad for whatever reason. And when we skip over the lament, in some ways I think we just honor the pain that people come with. And the lament gives voice to how long will we be silent? How long will we be silent? How long will we be silent? And I, I would wager everything I own, which is not a whole lot, <laughs> that everybody in this room has other stories, but probably not as good. Um, for fear of what others might think of us if they heard us. And then I read something which really helped, and this is another book that I have with me called Feeling the Storm about pastoral leadership and worship in times of crisis. Uh, there's a quote in here that says, 
Lament has had a lot. Lament is never meant to be admired in the heart, but lament is always looking to God. He had stinks now, but there's a new day coming. Yeah, it's tough and hot in the wilderness now, but there's something you are promised. So, uh, so there's a lot that we can do, I think, theologically that can prepare people. Uh, not, not that they're not still going to be hurt or impacted, but prepare people to at least have a worldview of theology that that is big enough to fit an explanation for an event that is that is terrible, and that's helpful because because people need to. Um, and you know that. I mean, you know that with people in the hospital and hospital loved ones, and and when they go through the process, maybe this is kind of what's happening. They see the wholeness that comes from that, and people who can't make meaning out of life uh, are very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Uh, there's another good book. Uh, I'm from a pastor. That's a book that was written by several people involved with me today. Uh, one of them, Lori Krause, is the director. Of Day, along with his colleagues Mr. Pullian and Richard Smith. And this is a wonderful resource uh, for churches. It talks about pastoral leadership and worship at times of uh, time. There's another book by Walter Brueggemann that you might be familiar with called the Psalms. And it breaks down the Psalms into um, three sections. And the first section he calls Psalm 103. And Psalm 103 is are those who follow the advice, they're going to get all the good blessing, and woe to those who don't follow because they're going to be cursed. And the right will be, or the righteous will be, will be rewarded, and the unrighteous will be punished. Isn't that the way the world is supposed to be? And he talks about that as a psalm of, um, of orientation, when everything's right with the world, when it's fairness, and all of that. But that doesn't last very long because uh, there's the psalms of David. And Psalm 73 is an example of that. In the last phrase uh, down here. How long, O Lord, foe to scoff, the enemy to revile your name forever. Why do you hold back your hand? Why do you keep your hand in your bosom? Uh, that that then happens, and it's just life is there. Uh, where are you, God? Still a man. And and he'll say that if um, again, if people stay the course, if they live in, in that time of ambiguity, difficulty, that wilderness. Area, then they come to a new orientation, which is uh, Psalm 23. And he calls Psalm 23 a, a new orientation because it does talk about the ancients. It talks about the valley. It talks about the shadow. But it talks about the hope that comes in knowing that God goes with us. And ultimately, when we're dealing with that, the people of faith, our hope is based on nothing less love and righteousness. God is our foundation. That always needs to be where we come from. Um, getting to the sheet that I handed out, uh, the, there's uh, the, the side that's the plan for training, and you can see all the different resources that are available, and there's direct links to all of these. So, um, so you can look at those. I heard some of you, uh, Tim and Cynthia, were talking about some other resources that are available, that are both locally and nationally. Um, I will say this, um, I will say there's no one right answer, but I will say that that if we have people who have taken these courses, uh, and one of them who even then then uh, on the Dallas training, the last one, and uh, what, what seems to be consistently presented from most professionals is that farming people, non-trained, non-professional people in the congregation is not a good so that's what we're hearing from most people. Because, um, and the statistics are that even somebody trained in law enforcement is after it gets a handgun wound 30% of the time. You know, now you're bringing in people who don't have the training or have minimal training. The adrenaline's flowing, they're, they're you know, hyped up. And, and so what we're hearing consistently, if you want to go to armed security, hire a professional. And I even heard of one church, I can't remember what presbytery this was, but that actually was offered, offered as a free service to local law enforcement. Yeah. 
and they totally changed protocols. But but anyway, wanted to I wanted to dollars um, So you see the different training on Alice means um, alert, lockdown, mm -hmm. inform, counter, attack, and pretty consistently the confrontation part of it is always last. Can't do anything else. Then control. There are other things because because the events themselves are very are shooting. Can be pretty short. Um, we also share this kind of control, and this is for your education and action for your congregation. Uh, I do think education is uh, to understand what is happening, what are the threats. Um, I heard you and you were talking about this. In terms of, I know the FBI has pretty much so many In terms of what is the likelihood that the House of Worship will be um, impacted in such a way? And then I think there's subsets of that. What's the likelihood that a fairly white mainline Protestant denomination will be impacted? And it's fairly low. It's fairly low. Now, well, that would be an example of the contrary, but, but it is fairly low. Um, that was the case with Lomet and some of the other ones. It tends to be more domestic related, where, where there's confrontation domestically. Unfortunately, it's not a problem with that. Um, but, but to educate. There's a site called gunviolencearchive.org, and um, I think you have that on the sheet too. You have that on the sheet? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, but this is a site, and they um, um, they just have to report all the shootings that take place, all the gun um, violence that is happening, and it's incredible how up to date it is. Home pages like in 2019, the red circles represents um, gun violence, and. Um, uh, to date, there are almost 54,000 fatalities with gun violence. Pretty, you know, getting January 1. And then I, I, I meant to find this, and I didn't, but I did find that an article that was dated February 2018. And that article said that four of the eight deadliest mass shooting events happened in the prior two years. So from roughly January, of 16 February 18, for the eight most deadliest mass shootings happened, and that would be like a part of what happened in the time span of uh, Las Vegas. Nine Walmart shooting in Paso. So we need to understand uh, the extent of the problem and, and what is happening. Uh, we do have. Uh, Somebody was mentioning about the video resources. Uh, John was mentioning about the video resources we have. One of them is a video resource called Twitter, and you can download it along with study material, and it talks about uh, the problem of gun violence. And I realize uh, that if South Carolina is like every other state in the nation, uh, just say, let's have a conversation about gun violence, and you can keep it aside from so uh, again, and I think that relates back to what Eric Gentry said, that because people are so scared, and it's such a, a people have such a personal investment in this topic, it immediately polarizes us, and and that's unfortunate because I, I, I personally think there is some reasonable middle ground that we all can take on that, but but I'm an optimist. Um, so this is a good good reason to be able to do that. Um. Yeah. My personal opinion, I'm not a scientist, so this is just my personal opinion. I don't think there's I don't think there's any uh, I don't think it's 
one thing that is one thing that I think we have to address. I think it's a combination of factors. And you hear that played out in the media. There were some um, there were some uh, media outlets that refused to to name the uh, the perpetrator. Uh, you don't want to give that platform to somebody. Um, so you do see that. And and I definitely I, I do think that's a contributing factor. But again, I don't I don't think there's any one there's any one reason why people do it. I think it's it's a combination of things. Um, Certainly, exposure, but I think the exposure really has more of an impact on both of us because we see it so often. Um, and when people are when people are overwhelmed by stress, they tend to go to one, one go to one of two behaviors, two Fs, flight or flight. And I think you have people that that what that do the flight by simply burying their head in the sand, and then you do people who are out there campaigning on one side or the other, we have to do this, we have to do this. Um, and again, I don't think we make our best decisions when we're operating at a fight or flight. And, and I think we need to look at the Yeah, the yeah, freeze can be a, can be a third F. That is the third, third F. Flight, flight, freeze, or a Do you have anything about that, uh, and recovery? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think there's back to I was asking about economics last yesterday. Um, I think there are economic issues and trouble again talking about what this window sees. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I think that's where we have to take those things that are necessary. Everybody is more or less. <laughs> Not directly. Well, you're all representing the president. But one of the things that we you know, is to is to not to look at it. I mean, here's one. Uh, you can get a suspended by PTA, whatever that means. Or you know, do something as vetted by, by Foothills so you can get ahead of it. Because churches are asking. And churches are doing that. And, and like anything, there's going to be resources out there that are credible, good, and do fit what is the mission of the church. Some are. And you can kind of get ahead of that to say, hey, you know, if you're going to do this, you're going to do this. One of the things we were talking about before, um, before we started this talk um, is uh, churches. My experience is that law enforcement wants to partner with churches as much as they can. Uh, but to have law enforcement come out and do a, uh, an assessment of your organization, have them walk around with a picture of the city or whatever, and, and just uh, hear what they have to say about some very simple and a lot of them are very low tech and, and uh, inexpensive ways to make your campus more secure and safer. Uh, and it always is good to, to make sure that you and, and law enforcement have a great relationship. Um, you don't invite them. Uh, have a have a little kiosk out in the parking lot on Sunday morning for them, something like that. So keep them keep them happy and keep them coming. And some of you have done that, I think. I think you have, you had talk talk to yeah, but, but doing things. And the other thing I, it's not in the presentation, but in terms of what you're going to do, um, if there is a shooting event, or even the threat of a shooting event uh, at a school, uh, the school will be locked down. And then the schools all have policies and procedures. And, and I think that it's going to be somewhat accurate to tell me again, that part of the protocol and policy is that there is agreement on the uh, relocation. Yeah, so even with the press material, there's a lot of resources and all this information that can be shared. With the reunification center, what I wanted to mention is that if you have churches, or if your church is close to a school, you may want to have a conversation with them about whether whether your school can serve in that capacity. And that's a, an outreach and research that's needed. Because most churches have a big parking area, uh, they have a big gathering area, sanctuaries for people to come. And, and my experience is that school and first responders. Uh, would welcome that, especially during this time, and would help with the uh,
That's been my experience with social media. Um, and many of them, as you know, people. Um, anything else in terms of what you as a congregation? Uh, and literally yeah. stop the bleeding. Yeah. yeah. And that's the first thing that about congregations or any other questions about how these congregations should be there for And then the training is on lessons learned and on the campus more of how to do things in terms of training. That might be something you can bring to the presbytery. We have a presbytery right now. Um, all right, so, so what happens when people get to the And that, uh, that would be the next uh, portion. And um, uh, this is drawing from the book, Recovery from Unnatural Depression. It's written by three mm -hmm. PDA people uh, specifically about how to have a resource congregation for uh, preparing for, well, not really preparing for, but responding to. A mass casualty trial. And um, so, pretty much what we're going to do now is summarizing some of the sections of the book, but it's available on Kindle. Um, I haven't seen it, if you're interested, it's a good thing to have because uh, again, it has a lot of really good resources, uh, pointers about leadership during times of crisis and working during times of crisis. Another one that I recommend is out of the Alman Institute, Civil in the Storm, uh, Worship and Congregational. Times. Same thing if you have pointers for what leaders should be thinking about, what the best practices for leaders uh, that lead their congregations during uh, times of crisis. And a lot of things are good encouragement resources, uh, litany, prayers, chat lines uh, during difficult times. Because uh, my experience is, and I think what, what we have to offer that other, um, other uh, organizations don't, is, is we offer times of sacred gathering. You know, what's the first thing that, that happens in church after after a tragic event, either nationally or locally? Let's open up the church and have a prayer service. Let's have a remembrance. And we have the liturgy to do that. We have the language to talk about to talk about shadows and wilderness and, and uh, separation from God. We we 
have hymns that, that speak to our heart. We have uh, the symbols. We have the ritual of uh, the waters of baptism, the bread and, and the cup. So, so we have something incredibly valuable to offer to that, that doesn't exist. And in other in other forms, um, and and there's some really good resources there. So um, going back to that graph that we had of the phase one, phase one when when PDA comes in, all we're focused on in phase one and that initial component is stabilizing. So, so we have a, a, a church that has just had a horrible event happen either in their community or in their congregation. And, and the role of PDA is to get together with that leadership group and, and stabilize, give them a, a space to breathe, um, to start thinking. Because you know what happens when 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 something traumatic happens, we go on autopilot, uh, we're running on adrenaline. And that is often necessary in the very first moments, but, but that has a short lifespan before there's a crash. And we begin to say, hey, let's, let's just sit down. Um, are you drinking? Are you drinking water? Uh, do you have anything to eat yet? Have you, have you taken time to check in with your family? Just to kind of stabilize some things. What are we long term planning in those first stages? What's going to happen tonight? And you don't start thinking about what's the Lenten series going to be uh, a year from now. It's, it's like, what are we going to do tonight? What are we going to do tomorrow? And, and, and offer that kind of calming. Stabilizing, less anxious, uh, less anxious. Um, you know, and you can learn from that. You can to add anything that you want. Um, I remember one story, not this trick, but with another one of our PD colleagues, got in the office with a cat. I don't remember her voice. I don't remember the voice of the voice. But, um, I don't know. Anyway, it was just going and, and they were talking and allowing that space, and kind of the anxiety and the stress level started to come down. Um, the colleague, the teacher's colleague, said, um, "What do you think about preaching?" <laughs> and and it was, a, it was a way for him, for the pastor, to have some, some space to breathe and then start thinking, "Yeah, I got to stand in the pulpit in next week." And uh, I don't know, I, movies. Uh, I like movies. Um, one of my favorite is probably. And, and they're trying to figure out the protocol to get back to, to Earth safely. And uh, there's one point where um, where uh, Mr. Stoll says, "Okay, take the manual that has all the procedures and rip all the pages out because we're going to start new." And, and that's what happens. Um, you know, uh, Bruce will always say, "You know what? You can, you can postpone Sunday. It doesn't have to happen on Sunday." Uh, but you gather and the community needs to address. Um, so we try to but As I mentioned uh, last night, I know not all of you were there or yesterday, PDA doesn't respond all the time. So, so every kind of discernment of whether or not to deploy a team starts with a phone call. 
and that phone call to the presbytery as it was in the case of uh, the shooting a couple of years ago, or it could be the presbytery that gets the conversation started. And I don't remember the specifics, Peggy. I don't remember the specifics, but, but the discernment that, that at least I had in Cambridge is that initial of being a deployment is not necessary. Uh, and generally, that means that uh, either either there was little or no uh, direct impact on the Presbyterian community, uh, or the resources were available to address it um, in an appropriate way, which I think is the case. And so if the resources are already there and they're already doing a good job, it would be a better player for them to be out somewhere uh, because that can be a true thing. And um, one of the things that we see over and over again is that PDA never sells its place. It's always at the end of the day when, when there's an appropriate place for us to be at. Um, so in that case, we did. Um, and then other times, like I, I mentioned yesterday, again, um, one of the most recent ones I've been at was, I think it was over the summer, there was a shooting in the DC. And we did deploy to that one again. Walk, walked to the Presbyterian staff, and, and there seemed to be an appropriate role for us to play, and we did, uh, we did deploy in that case with one person. Um, so, so we don't deploy to every event, but what we do is where we stand. Um, our focus is always first, um, not exclusively, but always first in the Presbyterian community. That's a point of entry. But as quickly as we can, <laughs> and that gets to the leader, uh, community faith leaders, we often, I'm not sure Rick Stevens did this on any of your deployments, but we often, during those initial deployments, will at least offer the opportunity for local clergy and faith leaders to gather, to process, uh, to share stories. Each other and to get the resources and direct and reach out. So, so we do that. We never come in saying we have to talk to the kids in the school where there's a shooting, or we have to talk to the congregation. We have to. Uh, that's not our role. Our role is always to support the local leadership. So, if we were to come into a particular conversation, our point of contact would be the community of Peggy and the leadership of Farmville. Um, knowing that you have the relationship with the congregation, you have the relationship with the community, you're in the best position to offer the support that they need. We're here to support you. And where this really, um, this has been just ingrained on my mind, uh, I was back from school this morning, I was waiting for the train to get back. There was a meeting that I sat in a circle, and at that time we did what we call kind of a debate thing. I had a series of questions that went around the circle, and one of the questions I asked was, where are you finding your support during this time? And uh, let's say, Zach, I think. Aaron. Aaron. Let's say Aaron is the Aaron was the regional director during the meeting. And we said, well, Aaron. And then we went to the youth minister. Where are you getting your support? Oh, Aaron. He's there from the office now. And then we went to the church administration. Where are you getting your support? Oh, Aaron. He's, the guy. He's there from the Went through literally the entire staff and everybody told me to turn. And just so that I'm in class, Aaron, where is your support? I don't know. And so, so that was teaching to me that, that that's where we come in that position at. And we certainly were there for the whole staff, but, but realized that uh, uh, the head staff was really looking for the head staff. And um, I've, I've read I've read an article. I think it was an article. In a book, but I read something that that said um, one of the greatest influences on how healthy a, a community's recovery would be is when they hear first or they recognize that they're worthy. So for those of you a pulpit after a big community or a natural disaster, what you say, don't ever estimate how important your words are during that time. Uh, because if you know, you can't even breathe, that's going to influence the whole community, at least that church community. Or if you can 
up and you're honest and you're transparent, but you offer words of grace and hope, lament, that will that will play out. That's why that's why we just try to offer offer some something and take it. So the next uh, and that's more more the short short term response. We're just trying to normalize things. Um, in terms of you know, what's what are the next couple of years? You know, and that's where you say, you know, do we really need to do that back or is the world gonna end if we decide not to do that in six years? Is the world really gonna end if we um, wipe the calendar clean and say, okay, in light of this event, what really is the most helpful? And so we just kind of normalize, kind of get into that daily routine, okay, the sun's gonna come up. Uh, breakfast will be served. Church will still be in church. You know, let's let's get back to some kinds of things. And you all know that who work with people who are grieving. They're just getting in. Let's go out for a cup of coffee. Let's, uh, you know, where do you like to walk? Where do you think you like to walk? We're just kind of getting back, getting people back in their some normal state of mind. Um, sometimes easier. Anyway, circumstances. What, what if, in case that's in the why not how long it was, that church is crime scene? That sanctuary is crime scene. How long will it go into the crime scene? You know, how long before the bullet holes are covered up? So, so that's, that can be really tough in some circumstances, but it's trying to get people back to something that's essential. That's kind of that second group thing. Um, always. Uh, education, you know, helping people understand. I remember that one. Uh, just by being able to have people understand and do things are really faster. It was a great moment of grace for the staff if I remember correctly there. Because they had words then and they could wrap around it to start getting into the meat and understand things. Um, Ongoing meditation. That's where you can start talking about some of the theological start doing some assessments of what are the things that you need to do as um, a faith in response to. And then starting to connect with the larger community and this opportunity to start to have those groups of people who are here to come together. So so you're here for the word. I know uh, in fact this is a book um, where there's a discussion about forgiveness. The first Sunday after a shooting at a music um, one pastor was outraged because another pastor in the community said it's the first Sunday after the shooting. The call to forgiveness. The call to, to, to you know, pray for the shooter and, and pray for their recovery and soul and see if they are not the perpetrator. So we need to forgive that person right away. And then it infuriated so many of the ministers. They said, Yeah, we forgive, but we can't forgive unless. Turn the angry first. Roll for anger and then lament and despair. And then there was no took away all all room for that. Um, and people need to go through those phases. So so you know, getting together academically, trying to get a, a forum where, where people can start talking about what are, what are the, the talking points that we want to be hearing throughout this larger community. Um, third phase, that's where we do a lot of emotional on the graph, the third phase is we see them in the depths of the valley and they take them up. And that took a lot of time to deal with the uh, emotional despair and the ongoing pain of the present. And that's where we do a lot where we try to offer either encourage faith leaders to take the necessary time for self care and to where we provide a tool for that. Uh, this could be a, a workshop, a compassion fatigue workshop, a resilience workshop, it could be a retreat. Um, it could be whoever could be the most immediately needy in the family. Um, um, where you have a worship, a time out in the community, and then the worship itself are most needy in the family. And then the fourth phase is where you're starting to claim the vitality, the growth, the movement that, um, that a, a path of grace is starting. And so, okay, so retreat. Radicals uh, are 
time and providing opportunities where people can reflect it. I mean, you don't want to go in sit in the pastor's office with the church staff two weeks after the Where is God in all this? Where do you see God doing things at that time? You may be thinking there's no difference. But now you start saying, what did you learn? What how are you different as a result of this? Nine months, you know, obviously uh, things are, are kind of running their course. Where's God? How have you experienced God? And get an opportunity to understand that. And again, those of you who have with individuals who have been going through trauma, and things like that, that you may have to do things by day. But when people are getting face to face to face with neglect, you often hear things like, or I learned something that I, I probably never would have had I not gone through this. And, and there's a lot of benefit that takes place uh, if people are able to, to be given a safe place to walk this and uh, get an opportunity to do that. And a lot of times this is going to be growth. And this is a lot about personal expressing and a lot of personal growth. And in all of this, in all of this, what we're trying to do is the church and community leadership from being reactive, from you know, knee jerk response, fight or flight, you know, to be intentional, uh, to be faithful. And, and that, that's what we spend a lot of time in the present. Letting the temperature of the community get to a comfortable level, giving space to breathe, being a less anxious, not anxious, but I'm drinking the Kool Aid, to be a less anxious presence than, 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 than the uh, uh, anxiety of the group. And, and those of you who have ever done any work with systems, I mean, you know how a person can influence the system. Either by getting them more anxious or less anxious, depending on who you are in the midst of that. You can actually lower a system's anxiety by being less anxious in the system. Or you can you want to ratchet it up if you want to, but it's not that, that helpful. Um, another resource we have is this on the sheet, and this is a, a resource and it's a pastoral series, and uh, there's about 15 videos, I think the longest may be like 15 minutes, maybe. they're not really long, and they cover different topics, so um, you know, feel free to access those, access those for free, um, you have a clergy group that you work with, you can do any kind of a monthly gathering or study, whatever, and you can do that on each one, you can download them all from Vimeo, I did anyway, so you have that as well. Um, and that's um, that's a kind of an overview of the human cause disaster ministry uh, in the region that you're involved. Um, I, I intentionally started with your congregation because everything is local, and I think the more you all can be proactive, um, you know, an ounce of prevention kind of thing, I think it can prepare you both to lessen the likelihood that you ever have to face this situation. Congregation, and I think you can also prepare your congregation if something happens. Um, question? Yes. Um, 
No, I think it's a lot easier to get a natural cause to kind of create a timeline. Um, it's much harder to get a human cause because there's so many variables. Like I was talking with um, Toby, uh, and I don't think he made it to the school. And her comment to me was, you guys are just going to say, the sentencing is going to happen right now. And so, can you get to wholeness or recovery when it's still an open wound? And I'm not sure was the uh, was the trial did it happen locally, and did it get covered in the news? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some variables that are involved in it. Um, it's something like, um, you know, the, it's hard to go a day without hearing about something related to white supremacy. Um, and if you believe that was part of the riot, part one of the factors, you know, every time you hear it, it's one more reminder, one more reminder. So, so there's a lot of attention when the wound can off. Where, you know, instead of being able to take the shoe off and let the blister heal, you have to keep wearing the shoe. It's hard to say. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sex in this sense. Um, but it's yours. on a local level, uh, some similarities in how you prepared and responded, some differences, and, and take advantage of that. You know, share resources. Um, unofficially, uh, you know, offer time within the press area to, you know, maybe that one training in South Carolina could be brought in, or it could just be an opportunity for y'all to sit in a circle and say, okay, what, and you guys were doing that before we started. What are you doing here? Oh, that sounds interesting. You know, that cross pollination but I would encourage you and then say here at least what we said is and think are faithful ways to approach this issue. Um, and uh, I'm not with you all week, but I am with you for one more time. We'll be talking about preparation. Uh, so we see stuff on the other side of the I do have, sorry, I just have one um, I'm sorry, I just have a good, I don't want to go, but I just give me another 45 seconds. Um, so, so what happened, well, we know what happened. There were two things that happened in like 12 hours of each other, uh, the shooting in um, El Paso, and the denomination to respond and put together a packet um, talk about gun violence. And, and I realized that, as I said earlier, uh, when I get uh, polarized in a hurry, just say, let's talk about gun violence. And, and it happens, but, or just guns, yeah. But here are some resources I brought some extra packets. A packet is mailed to every congregation in the presbytery. Sometimes they don't always get to where they need to be. If you'd like to take one, uh, please feel free. And uh, do it in what you Sorry about that, thank you.